Hello everyone, today we talk about Western Frankish warfare during the 12th century, mostly we mm, discuss a context that is actually wider, something between the 10th and the 12th um, included, which I already discussed by the way in other videos. Um, this year I managed to make several videos about French history, also Western Frankish history, uh, also from a military point of view. Um, and I plan to continue on that because mostly I concentrated on Italy and Germany if you notice it since, since the first years because I specialize in the Holy Roman Empire as a matter of fact but I need more French um, say pulp here to strengthen uh, Schwerpunkt's uh, structure because um, it, it's really as we've seen also in terms of the military developments of the medieval Europe the, the most important country right? there is um, hardly a doubt on the, say, civilizational mm, expansivity of the system and the um, essentially the, the spread of the Frankish model all over what we consider today as, in fact, I in a broader Western culture, right? This doesn't necessarily mean that France was, mm, and especially what we mean by the north of France, more developed in other ways, right? These were essentially more, if you want even more authoritarian lands where and the majority of the population was subjugated at an, uh, an earlier stage, but at the same time was more functionalized thanks to these essentially enormous estates that had remained intact throughout the, the centuries and uh, being strengthened uh, also throughout this time uh, to mm, favor the emergency of fundamentally feudal states uh, that in fact were very different in many ways from both the still largely tribal uh, system of you know barely evolving at this point um, uh, f quasi feudal system that in fact would become so in other countries um, uh, through the influence of the same Frankish model or a more kind of urban um, statal and um, centralized model that however didn't have, especially in, we're talking about southern Europe, the same degree of wealth distribution not to favor a political compaction like the one you find in France, which sounds also a bit um, uh, let's say paradoxical because of the uh, of the major three post-Carolingian kingdoms, as we've explained countless times, and as I have properly a playlist on post-Carolingian Europe, which is one of the m single most overlooked periods in European history, especially for the foundation of what would evolve um, in, in the millennia, as what we know today. Uh, the Western Frankish one had fragmented um, much quicker than the others. Right, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, the Italic Kingdom. If you look at them on the map, in terms of political uh, districtuation, uh, public authority, uh, in relative terms, right, they were more compact, more unitary. Right. Paradoxically, these two kingdoms, as you know, were aborted in terms of political unity. Right. Uh, they evolved essentially. In in an elective system that eventually in Ottonian times became the entire Holy Roman Empire, which France in theory is excluded, in, even though actually in theory should be included because the empire in included all Western Christendom and beyond, technically. But as you know, France doesn't become de facto part of the what we call at least the Holy Roman Empire. It also was called in, in different ways, different times. This is not the point. France fragments earlier Right, the process again of monarchic, um, let's say, of this aggregation of monarchic control over the country. That is the entirety of, um, of the thing that stretches from from the Channel to the Mediterranean. Right, it also has the county of Barcelona. That technically is Western Frankish Kingdom, south of the Pyrenees, um, and um, it has in part less territories in, on the east compared to modern France. Think about the Alsace, etc. But it also has something more in the northeast, um, Belgium, etc. Um, but it's 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 enormous, and this thing disaggregates faster. Why? Exactly because uh, the lack of a of a centralized state, 
right, historically, you know, as in terms of public authority, etc., had always been there in Frankish times. The Franks had had a lot of very powerful military clientels thanks to essentially private power, this enormous tenures, again, that had remained more or less even intact since Gallo-Roman times, um, and that had favored a process of um, local stabilization, of sounder stabilization locally, at the expenses, yes, of a central power. But that, paradoxically, would be um, a stronger glue to eventually confer that power to, to a monarchy, as France becomes par excellence later, by being co-opted within this, in fact, very powerful um, uh, elite competition, which is the thing it really, really makes it, right? France had much more powerful elites than Germany or Italy. But there were so many that for a long time struggled right, uh, to prevent that a single ruler could fundamentally um, subjugate them, right? could at least control them in a way they could lose part of their own prerogatives. And this thing goes on for a long time. right? This, this is a bit the process of state building. Um, like As it happens also in many countries when they eventually get uh, feudalized the, fr the Frankish way, right? Um, and that have all original characteristics, but do fit a bit in, in this kind of feudal hierarchy. Um, so, as a consequence, this elite, Western Frankish elite, had uh, a great personal private uh, power that was translated on the battlefield, and the military organization, military potential, how much they could and would deploy. This is the reason why uh, also feudal warfare, as we know it, so on, the long, on the long run, it was a very, very gradual change. It took centuries to pass from kind of the early medieval uh, kind of migration era type of cavalry that was, it w it was strong, right, and already stronger than infantry, um, especially in this probably, con con yeah, mostly Western, but especially continental reality. Um, but we're somehow still, it's the same thing um, translated at a political level. These individuals were richer right, than the average, uh, let's say, ancient German uh, or Roman freemen. But um, in this sense, they, they could unite. They had a, s a sense of... Um, Esprit de core of identity and so on, but they didn't have much of a collective training because the monarchies were still weak, right? These were peoples that had migrated in largely autonomous ways, guided by some leaders that had established even very powerful monarchies like in France, where in fact there is already a very strong cavalry um, due to its uh, collective strength, thanks to the, to the aforementioned Latifundia, the possibility of training a lot and so on. So that's why also France emerges with the Carolingian Empire and all, in the, and previously also with the Merovingian one as the, uh, the largest power um, in Western Europe. But still, again, there is no um, superior power, like properly a, a structured feudal state that can at least regulate further the, um, the nobility. And this is exactly what we look at today, that is to say, the beginning of that uh, training, the, the, the beginning of that discipline, the beginning of that rule over these elements. Um, and so the thickly packed, uh, couché, length, heavy cavalry, uh, shock charge tactics that we know a bit essentially being fully developed by the 13th century, remaining essentially those ones, as long as feudal Europe existed as such. Um, and that we identify with also much of the, the, the medieval mythology. Way. So, uh, the Western Frankish Kingdom is also mm, different for political uh, and strategic reasons from the other post Carolingian countries. Let's make an example with the Eastern Frankish one comparatively. Um, in the Germanic world, um, differently from France of the time, the um, degree of uh, external threat was 
much higher. This may seem strange because we think, well, you know, still by the 10th century, France, after all, was very much uh, hit uh, by the, the Viking raids, right? And the, also the, there were the Saracens in the south and the Magyars came to raid as far as in the, Fra in, uh, the French heartland. And so um, is, is this really true, right? France seems like a bit more the most vulnerable of all the, the, the various states. Uh, this is not really the case. First of all, by the 10th century, most Viking expeditions had been curbed. What you have in 911, as you know, which will, as we'll see today, for a long time created lots of political and military consequences. The Normans had been settled uh, in the lower Seine Valley by the same Western Frankish king, but eventually as a buffer state to stop the incursions in the same Seine. So also the most important valley of, uh, as far as especially the monarchy, uh, the French monarchy was concerned. The Loire was also, of course, even more important in a broader Western Frankish sense, but um, the Western Frankish kings, as a consequence of Western Frankish political disgregation, controlled a very few outside of the Ile de France, right? And they had just like the state on their own, uh, provincial level fundamentally, just like most um, French lordships really were um, all, all around. Um, so much to also threaten the existence of the same royal, mm, let's say, house per se, but I mean properly the base of power, right? So that was objectively at least under a strictly political point of view, um, not really a teleology of mm, of French recompaction, at least in the way we, we it took place under the Capetians with that specific ideology, with the, the, the specific center of power and so on. These worlds were importantly urbanized historically, at least since Gallo-Roman times. The, the French... Um, cities had played um, a very important role um, probably also in the civilization of the Germanic element there had been a of course an alliance between the king and the cities and read there the, the bishops right so this happened pretty much everywhere and wherever a kingdom form of some sort because actually was Christianized and it had a diocesan administration over which also the um, the temporal power could install itself very often by same ecclesiastics as we will see now in the same France like pretty much everywhere but also always siding with the idea of the necessity of an order the necessity of, of a state the necessity of a head um, which is not really a matter of opinion and yes in relative terms is a better thing right? it's not just uh, a bigger mob than the others. It's, it's a qualitative improvement because you have those who know how to handle more because they do already compared to the smaller um, lords uh, is more functional to the stabilization of the entire system and the further expansion of it and that's why France comes eventually to, to be the single most um, powerful policy in, in medieval Europe on the longer run. But it took a long time. There were lots of vassals that would have not um, given up and in fact fought their wars against the same crowd. Um, and as we'll see, it's difficult even to attach sympathy to them because in many ways they were, they were smart. They were capable on their own. But they lost the war on the long run. So at least as far as you know, wh what was the, the quality of the power in relative terms to them that could emerge to, to curb this this, this uh, robber uh, barons fundamentally. Um, well, this in France succeeded. It did not succeed in Germany, for example. In spite of the enormous efforts, sometimes even more energic than the Western Frankish ones that again were starting from a, after all again, a better served um, reality, infrastructurally, culturally, socially, right? The the Western Frankish populations were from centuries habituated to, to that kind of uh, essentially feudal regime 
right? And they had, in a sense, wanted it because, um, albeit it also asserted, enforced, and you know, established itself, it was also done so by proving again that uh, there was not a, a better option worth dying for, right? And people in that sense uh, were exhausted uh, also by the, the same the same military force that at a point were necessary to however consolidate further um, and as we were saying before thus when you look comparatively at post Carolingian kingdoms you realize that France was actually much more European core land than, than Germany was than Italy was, because these latter regions were much more exposed to external influence in a way or another. The Eastern Frankish Kingdom dealt mostly with the Magyar threat that uh, at a point risked to make collapse great part of what had been the probably the German colonization, also essentially the Carolingian or even Merovingian um, route in the especially in the easternmost uh, frontier the duchies of frontier, talking about S Saxony, Thuringia, and Bavaria, that were hit constantly, regularly, in a, in a disruptive way by the Magyars, that in that sense were carried out also much scorched earth um, strategy and uh, aiming at destabilizing a system that was, again, in fact, much somehow easier to destabilize than it would have been France at the end of the day. Uh, the same Viking threat in France, uh, after all, is is limited. There were several. France is huge, right? So, extension you have to consider also that we're talking about a much bigger country with lots of different lands, people, um, and and local powers. So, the the Viking incursions were dramatic in France, especially during the ninth century. Um, but at the same time, you um, you see that there is not much of a headway that is made. Right? You have a northern frontier, which you can include the same, the same uh, lower sand valley, where you can say, okay, well, that those were the closest um, lands to the North Sea. The the Norse were somehow more um, uh, more easily infiltrating them. But at the same time, what you see in the case of the Normans is that uh, these people settled mixed with the local population and by the time of the uh, conquest of England w when you talk about the Normans of Normandy th these are purely and exclusively and totally Western Franks every, uh, under every political military social point of view right they are a perfect copy of essentially of a civilization that had been developing the, in the interland that the descendants of the Norman settlers had perfectly absorbed. So much to even, you know, fix it, m make it even more centralized, actually, than, um, than what the French were doing. Not because, as you know, in Scandinavia there was anything more centralized than, than uh, the, the continental uh, political institutional systems. It, that, would, that would take centuries before th the gap was 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 closed right uh, almost essentially the, the end of the middle ages themselves so you understand there the potential that it, that existed within this enormous land mass the fact that again um the great uh western frankish lords were enormously powerful think about aquitaine is basically a huge country within this enormous country uh, that is the western frankish kingdom uh, you have again enormously powerful vassals that at some point become or already are m more powerful than the French kings and this obviously is uh, evident f for the case of the n dukes of Normandy that conquer England but also the other vassals were were really really very strong there is of course uh, a glowing factor in the north of France on the right bank of the Loire that separates in fact as you know the Languedoc from the Languedoc uh, and in this sense is really the, the border between two different countries France properly meant so the one in the north and the south that is Occitania and is it is another country objective 
These are both Romance um, populations, but they speak differently. They have different lifestyle, different uh, landscapes, different, um, in fact, different influences politically from, from the surrounding um, uh, countries. And yet again, the, the, there is no real presence around that is able to, let's say, establish in France some kind of lordship or um, managing to shatter the same uh, structure of the kingdom per se, right? Those were the, the Western Franks that were perfectly able of preventing, paradoxically. You can argue that in Eastern uh, Francia, it was the same German um, dukes that not wanting uh, a dynastic affirmation in the country that in fact would remain an elective monarchy, even support directly the Magyars to go cause damage to the neighboring competing duchies. This is what the Western Frankish counts really did as well with the Vikings, except that they were ruling from much more advanced and powerful realities than say the, the Eastern Frankish ones that also at a certain point say okay well uh, we will still manage to keep our own autonomy but now these Magyars have come too far right we have to unite uh, at least under the temporary guide of, of the Saxon house and uh, getting rid of that because even from that further eastern side was really not much of a civilizational option that the Magyars were presented to anyone, right? And you don't really find Magyars settling like the, the Normans um, and, you know, accepting their own homeland and so becoming also remaining a power on their own. Um, whereas Germany actually is the one that goes on the offensive and colonizes and infiltrates for France in this sense is much more compact on its own. It has also in fact much more internal interests before directing its um, its ambitions elsewhere, right? If not as some sort of private business again like the Dukes of Normandy for, for England. Um, Western Francia was not a frontier country. This is what I would like to stress, right? Italy was. Italy in the south had Byzantine presence that also as far as the, the broader empire, western empire that existed in one another even after the Carolingians it was revived by the Ottonians, in fact it was competing against um, it had uh, a Longobard presence still in the southern interland that was somehow ambiguously either under, mostly under the, the western empire um, but also winking at the Byzantines, even at the Arabs, actually the only headways that the Arabs or the Arabized elites of, of Tunisia could, could make from from North Africa, from Sicily in the Italian mainland were essentially asked for by the uh, southern Italian rulers to counter each other and other parts. So exactly as we, what we've seen just for, for Western and Eastern Francia at the same time. But as you know, also in there, at least the Saracen presence would be coastal, whereas the Byzantine one also was, but aimed at a kind of real stronger conquest. Um, but southern Italy especially was a huge frontier, right? And um, there were also the same Mediterranean was in, in a broader sense, or at least for escaping you know, there the, the force of a centralizing power that in Italy basically disappears with the, even in intentionally at the beginning of the 11th century when the last Italic nobleman attempt to uh, create essentially an Italic ruled kingdom uh, trying to expel uh, the Germans. Then eventually the communes take over so there is a, um, a completely different scenario that they will take that matter in, the, in their hands. There's basically the same people at the end of the day but um, still there is no centralized state, nor in Italy, nor in Germany. With, with France, um, we see um, also there is not a real, for example, from military territory as the marches. Right? Um, if you look at the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, 
you see that uh, such the, the word districts that were properly conceived by the local rulers as bulwarks of the empire in, uh, from, from north to south. You have the Bilungen Mark, the North Mark, Lusatia, Misnia, the Ostmark, that is at the origin of, of the future Austria. You have the marches of Styria, of Carinthia, of Carniola, right? And also there is not the, the level definitely of um, also marginal power that you find, for example, in Italy that had maintained some important provincial um, feudal powers, especially the Anscaric mark in the in, in the northwest, the, the eastern mark in um, in Friuli, or even the the Duchy of, of Spoleto, and this other or the marks of Tuscany, by the way, that were quite also warlike their own ways, but they also um, corresponded their autonomous establishment that was aiming at not having nobody prevailing. Uh, thanks also to the somehow the centralized position south of the Alps, sort of, so for the mm, from the perspective of a uh, imperial uh, revive. So coming back and definitely focusing on the Western Frankish Kingdom, west of the Meuse, of the Seine, and of the Rhone rivers, the military forces developed in great part without external interference. This is a deeply important aspect, right? what you see eventually overflowing from the Frankish war during the age of the Crusades, of the Norman conquest of England, of Sicily, um, the, uh, the, the, the age of cathedrals, of, of the fact of feudal monarchies as such, is properly um, a French reality. Right? It, it's, it's a French product um, and uh, something that emerges from properly from the within, from the immensity, if you want, of the Western Frankish demographic and agricultural resources. Right. And so you have interesting mm, output as far as, in fact, the Norman conquest of England is concerned, even the Reconquista, right? So something that eventually would um, culturally overwhelm even the East, even the Byzantine Empire, it, everything w was to go under this kind of a base, right? The Franks, even if you look at this of course, post Carolingian kingdoms, they were all Frankish at that point because um, also, again, Germany, Burgundy, Italy, and so on were all Frankish in that, in, in the broader feudal hierarchy, in the type of prevailing vassalatic beneficiary system. They were all different, but still part already of that Frankish thing, right? And that's also how they were called in, in, in a way, aside from, yes, maybe south of the Alps, uh, they were known as the Lombards still, but the the, the core there is still essentially a, a, a broadly western uh, and uh, Vesalatic beneficiary, thus Frankish in, in the way it had developed largely as the center of uh, and um, com also consolidated through the dynamics that had already been privatistic and feudal in, in the other countries that had been conquered, right? Also, if you look at, uh, I don't know, the, the laws of recruitment in countries like that were already under uh, the Frankish domination or influence, you see that uh, that this had autonomously developed sort of vassalatic beneficiary system of some sort. Just the extent of the, again, the, the power concentration in fewer hands that you find in France, nobody really has. You can find, again, richer countries in, in per capita wealth, things like the East and France, absolutely, especially Southern Europe was like that. But the concentration, politically, institutionally, and, and again, the possibility that this entailed to develop a permanent, de facto, professional military force, as far as the properly the personal, the private retinues, etc. were concerned, well, you didn't really find much else if not after the Frankization and the consolidation of that system. Talk about permanent forces, I literally talk about the fact that um, even though the system was all de facto decentralized, um, depending 
what we can see in terms of concentration of power and so on. What you um, what you realize is that of course these people were always fighting, so we're we're properly designed as the feudal elite to just fight all their lives, and so de facto independently on from their their political allegiance, they would always fight as permanent forces because their lifestyle was e exclusively that. There was not a, a diversion. That's also what basically the the Merovingian, the Carolingian elites had managed to take over most of Western Europe like. They only fought. That's the only thing they did. They didn't know how to read. They didn't have a civil education. They they say participated morally, uh, authoritatively to even the the trials, this kind of things because they embodied authority, but they they wouldn't do anything else literally but fighting for their entire lives in training even in moments of uh, of peace by the way that you can't even really identify because it's such again a, a, um, um, an existentially habituated reality to war that um, that was their entire raison d'etre right in, in Germany for example you can argue that there was a higher militarization of the population because um, it was a much less socially stratified reality so uh, there, were, there were less elites and it was mostly the militias that at least the, the militias were more involved than than elsewhere in in the empire the defense again against the Magyar raids against the Slavs by the way that were would always remain on the frontier and a very unstable one so people were just more apt to that kind of raiding warfare kind of they weren't more effective militarily speaking but let's say in that sense the also the mentality was deeply informed in France it was much more order but it was maintained with the sword with the ultra elite training of a few people that controlled basically all the others and this is uh, again essentially what we talk about when we see France um, think about the participation of Western Franks in the Reconquista aside from the Crusades for example that is a somehow overlooked aspect because also the same Crusades in the Near East were basically uh, a French business largely there were other contingents from all over Western mostly again post Carolingian Europe and or its uh, eventual uh, acquisitions such as England and Sicily but again the the lingua franca was, was literally the lingua franca French um, and uh, the same goes for again the majority of the knights that uh, participated to the Reconquista from 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 abroad they mostly came from France and we will analyze again this probably in another video. So it doesn't matter how limited territorially the say the range of military operations were in France. This is true in general for medieval Europe. When we look at all this fragmented reality and realize that most resources were spent to fight uh, in interiorly because they literally like there was even Europe as such was not really the subject of a terrible onslaught from the external most of the the attacks were somehow in, in frontier areas and Europe as such was never really threatened at least it was so strong to mostly be concerned with internal affairs than else because it was very crowded and it was very be beginning to be also very rich Right, and especially in areas like like France, like Italy, etc. And as such, what you really see um, is an enormous uh, amount of resources invested locally. Right, you can see this all these feudal lords, this, this emerging uh, city states, etc., fighting against each other on distances that are just um, maybe a few tens of kilometers but that doesn't mean actually that 
this system was designed, let's say just it was just the the, the range of the operations uh, um, extensionally is the measure of a of a military power, right? These were think about Godfrey of of Bouillon, say a Flemish um, count, know about in, in the 11th century about Syria, about Palestine, uh, about Lebanon. This guy manages with lots of other uh, barons like him to organize a, 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 an incredibly efficient and especially effective military expedition to take over Jerusalem, one of the most important um, cities in, in the Mediterranean. This, this thing tells you what were already the capacities of the Western Frankish um, civilization at the time. You're essentially military one, right? So even though when studying, for example, the Capetian military history, we look at these guys moving within, again, mm, theaters of operations that are hardly exceed mm, a f very few hundreds of kilometers um, until the reign of Philip Augustus between 1180 and 1223, where, as you know, after Bouvin that we described in multiple videos, managed to, to crush uh, the, uh, the, the Anglo-Norman presence um, in, uh, in France and to, to overwrite the entire country, right? even invading Occitania and uh, on the longer run his descendants managed to, managed to reconsolidate all the, all the power, eventually attacking the same, the same, uh, the same county of Barcelona, the same county of, of, of Flanders in a more properly pervasive um, imperialistic an exciting way, um, you have yet uh, probably another level of, uh, of political and strategic planning. You have uh, the, the French, again, basically taking over Constantinople and leading the, all the, the major crusades, having probably a Mediterranean power, controlling the also the, the, the southern Italian uh, mainland Sicily directly from France, right? Which is something that it's not that Normans of Sicily had technically done, they conquered those lands on behalf of, of the French king or anything. They they were just adventurers, still, again, uh, so, say, children of that Western Frankish world, but um, not politically connected, so just part of that other that group of of Western Frankish lords, and sometimes even just again this adventurers, mercenaries, that played in this incredibly intricate Western Frankish theater. Um, so, what is quite indicative, instead of the resources that were present in this Western Frankish kingdom, is the time that the Capetians spent at war, just per se. Again, it seems like, you know, while the Germans were uh, invading Italy and mm, trying to reunite East and West and whatever, France was just sitting there, right, until Bouvin, from, from ever, from, from Carolingian times, this, nothing had happened, except again from the, this Norman offspring and then uh, not much more. But when you realize what kind of state building was being done by the sword in in the in the heartland of France, you really realize also why that terrific military culture was was there, right? And how this country could, in a sense, pave the road to its own uh, cultural hegemony, just true true war in a way. Reason for which today we observe the operations, as an example, the military operations waged by Louis VI, known also as the Fat, but another nickname was the, the warlike, Western Frankish king between 1188 and 1137. Right. Um, so in this phase, the Capetian monarchy descending from the uh, Robertian 
branch, like the Counts of Paris, that had fundamentally installed itself after the Carolingians in the Ile de France, ruling from Paris, and the, the immediate surroundings having, in, in fact, securing the, the Western Frankish crown, and starting to re-elaborate on that, uh, in fact, very old um, Frankish royal mythology. Think about Saint-Denis, the Oriflamme, the old spiritual bond, properly with, with, with blood, and with a sword, right in, as probably the, the emperors rather than the kings, just, um, in their own country, right, as properly as a, as a um, existential right, right, not uh, a matter of opinion or somebody could context, but again, that you would normally take the sword to have r r asserted, because doing that was the right in itself, that's what that was in fact the mentality of this war. If you won militarily, it was because God had wanted it. So you were perfectly justified, or at least you know the, you could always be um, uh, defeated, and so you had always to act and to fight again. And as we will see, of course, every war is a, a bit about defeat, about a bit about victory, and there are lots of political problems and social problems to address in the meanwhile. So that's that's how. The dynasty came to to mold what we know as the the French state from this again relatively like its extension of the Ile de France is quite modest, right? It's just it has a very fat, um, rich, fertile soil, right? This helped a lot, even particularly the, the capacity of cathedral building that the uh, Capetians and their vassals pioneered, especially the church, uh, which had enormous uh, estates as well all around and mostly signed it with, with the French king. Not always, but still uh, normally for for the more um, kind of publicly and statally oriented ecclesiastical bias, let's say, and greater administrative cultural literacy administration in that regard would dramatically help the crown. Um, it would manage to, to literally, by shoulder pushes affirming itself uh, in in the surrounding and especially in in the north of France that was uh, as we've seen the most important the one in which the uh, let's say again those those enormous estates were in the hands of few were more concentrated so where most threat came from but at the same time with more uh, reward came from too in case of of success and that would eventually bring, in fact, the North to rule a bit all around, and um, and um, in a, even, again, uh, in, in perspective, the same English kingdom as we know it in from Norman times is a product of that kind, right? The, the Normans conquered England and subjugated, by the way, in one of the single most brutally systematic ways in the in medieval history, um, very different stories from other lands that, that, that the Normans conquered. For example, the, the conquest of Sicily was pretty smooth. Um, um, in that case, you have properly uh, the, 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 the face of the systematic habituation in case of hard resistance, like the one that came from the Anglo-Saxon world, especially from the Midlands, but you know other territories that also did have some important military capacity of, uh, on a local level. The, the most radically violent capacity of the Western Frankish uh, culture that was forged literally in this constant feuds being fought locally. And again, the reign of Louis the Sixth is quite enlightening. He was known as the Fat because even though he was habituated to fight uh, on a regular basis since sixteen, uh, and he was very. Uh, apparently very energetic, and uh, and so he was cut for that job, let's say. By his 40s, he had become so fat that he had difficulties to, properly, for the athleticism that was required in that in that role, even to to to, to stay on horseback and all these kind of things. Um, don't underestimate the fatigue of this, these people. Naturally, in many ways, uh, the as you know, the, the medieval nobility was... Uh, 
eating and drinking somehow with um, an incredibly, in fact, caloric type of nourishment, um, they, they, they brutalize themselves in that sense because it still was a way to to prove each other's physical strength and power in a way. But as you understand, on the longer run, doesn't matter that life was um, dramatically short, but uh, in fact, by your 40s, the, the organism I had already began to say, look, I'm, I'm exhausted by this. In any case, he went on. Um, he was a uh, son of Philip I, who had ruled between 1060 and 1108. Um, that's again a phase of mostly consolidation of the the Capetian acquisitions. With Louis VI, you have instead the beginning, properly of the systematic um, reclamation, if you want, of the royal prerogatives over the entire Western Frankish kingdom. In other words, they were retaking what, by right, um, they felt was, was theirs. Also because, again, the king had that public vest and, and, and prerogative, right? The, the kingdom had existed. The fact it had de facto fragmented for centuries from a political point of view doesn't mean that the kingdom did not exist anymore, right? Everybody, even those who were fo fighting against the king, were, um, were, were okay with the idea of the kingdom because there were lots of advantages that could derive from, say, signing with the king or maybe even taking his place in some in some prerogatives of saying, you know, look, you, you should be king, but you're not able to win against me as a rebel, so what kind of king are you, right? And aggrandizing their own power. It is true that south of the Loire, um, the, the, there was a kind of um, rejection to northern policy in many ways, because they thought, again, they were different people. Um, I made a video about southwestern Francia, um, which uh, you realize that after the Capetians, probably Hugh Capet came to, to power and um, also in a pretty mm, cunning, shrewd, and somehow con as, as it was considered at the time a loyal way, properly the South had even stopped counting kings in their chronicles. They, they refused the, the concept that, that the Capetians had been their new rulers. But and there would be new attritions, not much because the, the French eventually invaded the south, um, but because, uh, as you know, the son of Louis the Sixth, Louis the Seventh, would marry the heiress of, of the Duke of Aquitaine, Eleanor, that eventually divorced uh, from him and married uh, the the English king, and so uh, that uh, opened to you know a more uh, warring phase, even properly for the Capetians, um, in terms of prerogatives over essentially a larger territory than, than is the one that de facto the, the, the monarchy controlled, or even properly the, 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 the vassals that were loyal to the monarchy controlled. Um, in France, right, without counting the entire kingdom of England, <laughs> as you know, but that's another story and we will talk about it. Some of you ask me, well, I would like to know more about the, the, the armies at the time of, I don't say, the English army, specifically the town of Richard II. I still haven't made a video about that, um, but there is a medieval English warfare playlist, and I said something here and there, and I will surely cover the topic at some point. So, the role of Louis VI as a, as a knight, as essentially the, all these high noblemen, regardless of the monarchic um, status, regarded themselves to be, right, in a mentality of the king being just a primus inter pares, and so having been, if you want, even temporarily chosen for that role, like in the ancient Germanic tradition, right, but that uh, it was a, a tradition that substantiated uh, itself in the military fitness, right, like in Rome, like the imperium had to be earned, right, if you were defeated, what kind of emperor were you, right, it meant that you were imperfect, that the gods had, had actually God, because also in what we call pagan times, it was only one superior absolute god, and by the way, they conferred, it was the one that conferred military power, the imperium, uh, this uh, couldn't help your, your, your incapacity, 
your unfitness and that's where the big issues begin that's that's also where the investiture controversy drew most of the political leverage from because of course if it was communicated uh, a christian emperor uh, no no vassal felt to be bound to him any, anymore so the the question uh, was really about what, what are the standards also that the leadership mu must have also the French at a point had problems with, with the papacy with the church because of course it was a lot of uh, internal violence waged also against the, the, the various prelates that could oppose this or that king uh, as you well know um, etc but the military role of the Western Frankish king is essential, right? As he was the head of the royal army, the as the Dux Exercitus. This is a very important title because Exercitus is a term that uh, in Middle Latin, as uh, it derived as such also from from the from the ancient one, indicated properly the collective army of the people, country. Um, kingdom etc right so it's not just a there are many other terms to to define other armies contingents but this was probably the le the, the levy of the entire kingdom it was more like an armada than, than an army proper because it it as we will see as would happen it summed the contingents of all the country ideally because eventually as we've seen there was no way to say ask the uh, the Count of Toulouse to participate, and even though the, the most important polities, even at, at a greater distance, were still the ones that had more political connections in a way. Um, they could even send more support, not necessarily from a military point of view, but still, as war is a continuation of politics by other means, concretely for fueling, in fact, this, this moral and military force. Um, uh, it was normal also in, in the other kingdoms. That's what probably the, the royal dignity was felt the most from a public point of view, knowing how to levy an army, right? Being fit enough for requiring that service that in, in, in theory is undue. It has in theory nothing to do with the, the vassal um, connections that are just private, even for the king himself. It's in theory the older Romano-Germanic levy. The exercitus, in fact, the ban, right? And it was called like this. Also, to understand better this role, the Western Frankish king was defensor regni, right? So there was a lot of just war theories still being uh, fueled at the time. So the idea that, let's say, the considering the, the, the regnum under attack so that you needed a defensor was seen as a greater justification, legitimization for calling, again, to war troops that subjects that were not to, to perform that for any other reason in fact a threat against the entire realm so passing to Louis curriculum militarily wise we see that when he was around 16 he made his first battle experiences uh, in the conflict that opposed him to William the Red, King of England and Duke of Normandy. The main threat posed was that one. The, the Dukes of Normandy controlled the Seine Lower Valley, in fact, and thus Estuary. And this was a great problem for, for Paris on the Seine that, of course, in this sense, depended on what the uh, commercial policies of of the Normans there really, really were. There were lots of fortresses along the sand that were object of, of content. It was a sort of um, um, free area in between where, in theory, the castellans had to be uh, impartial, not signing or for the Western Frankish, or for probably the, the Norman ducal side penalty being raised to the ground so 
uh, there were many attritions coming from this, also for many other reasons that, as you know, are political. Um, uh, the Louis would support William Cortos, uh, would place him even in the control of Flanders, because uh, his this was essentially the the, na uh, the nephew of of the same King of England, had been rebel to his uncle, and so on. All these kind of messed it. I I discuss, if anything, in some detail in those videos I make about the historical regions where I talk about the single uh, provincial policies of this and that power and that have to do with this. I made a video on the Dutch of Normandy for that for that matter and others because here they were around, like they were all intertwined right? um, so you see at, at an early age you are already um, a full-blooded knight by lifestyle, by inclination, all your previous uh, education was aimed at preparing you to be to be a warrior, not just say a leader of men, but f as as a beginner, of course, just knowing how to fight technically and uh, in a quite competitive, brutal, uh, abusive, uh, traumatic environment where people, you know, this young um, men were destroyed psychologically and then rebuilt together to, to become essentially nothing else but killing machines uh, deprived of any form of human mercy. Of course politics entailed that you had to somehow understand the, the logic of, of this, not just being a psychopathic serial killer, but first of all you had to know how to handle being a psychopathic serial killer yourself and then you could rise in the in the uh, in, in the ranks and in the mansions and the responsibilities and so it was a very important testing ground as dangerous as you understand also for for hares for again for people who were to be next kings there could be dynastic crises being open it's also how Flanders rebelled by the way they assassinated the count because they knew that there wasn't really that they could have easily for succession matters open a crisis that could be exploited by the local nobility and so on so very delicate situation but at the end of the day, given that war was the average dialectic in these contexts, also politically, um, at least one of the most important, uh, there was really no other way you could you could say I say I don't I won't fight. It was seen a form of weakness. Your vassals would have fundamentally just deserted you because you were considered uh, as a coward. Um, as an incompetent ruler and you must fight. In 1098 Louis VI uh, multiplied the incursions in regions like Berry, in Auvergne, in Burgundy, in Ponthieu, so also more far away lands, so getting habituated to logistical planning. Mm. The Franks since quite a long time, uh, as soon as they had taken control of the Gallo-Roman areas, had pres tried to preserve as much as they could all the local administrative capacities, again this huge latifundia some of which were used literally to support the legions on the Rhine frontier and were passed to to, to fuel instead this local, um, this, this private clientele, um, and you know that the Carolingians managed to to conquer Europe and to hold it for, for a significant uh, while thanks to their extremely developed logistical net there was a huge preparation there were some properly um, tolls exacted or at least even m mostly they were in nature telling the truth for the uh, for the forage the fodrum was one of the m single most important taxes in that regard it could be monetized etc there is an increase of this and you can see also by the scale with uh, greater monetization, mercenary service, professionalism so on, this in parallel to the construction of a more advanced administration but that was created, developed say to 
to sustain this enormous military costs. Um, even for expeditions, you would say, well, these are somehow modest in number of troops participating, but for the time it was an enormous cost. Right? We're stu still talking about the early 12th century. It's an incredibly archaic and primitive time still. And we may think that the 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 effort was limited, but it wasn't limited at all for those times. Uh, requests like they literally some of these expeditions could exhaust entire years of supplies um, locally. It was very very complex to manage. Sometimes they would come to exhaust. In fact, the, the local military capacity as well. Some years of peace weren't quite so because there wouldn't be reasons to fight, but because the, the contenders had literally ran out of resources and they, they would have incurred into rebellions if they had uh, tried to push further that way. Now, in 1101 and 1102, Louis besieges Montmorency. Wa he wages a campaign against Dreux de Mouchy, whose castle is uh, destroyed with fire. These are actually uh, close localities to Paris. There was already the the Capetian center of power and, and, and it's as if there had been a ring of very powerful noblemen all around the Ile de France that were essentially fearing the royal expansion and thus uh, aligned themselves to prevent uh, further uh, further power increase and holding their castles and somehow trying to choke the same Capetians in the process. So it was very important to break them. As we were saying before, the fact that they were close to Paris doesn't mean that uh, the local uh, armies couldn't in the same years again arrive up to the Near East as they literally did. Um, it means that locally they needed to solve that problem there. Um, and uh, again, in 1102, concentrating his forces in Rheim, Louis fights for two months in a row against Eble II, Count of Roussy. Mm -hmm. Naturally, the warfare had a lot of seasonalism still. There is a lot of also chivalric uh, literature talking about the beauty of spring, of blood spilling, uh, of uh, the the fact of this this force, this fire, being reignited, and uh, the the cycle of, of the year actually revolving around this. Properly, times uh, May is the in, in in northern France is the month of war when war begins. Right when you go um, pillage in the end, all the uh, the enemy uh, fields have where the, the grains which have matured uh, when you um, when, when there, there is a good weather when it's warm where you can sustain that kind of military fort uh, for a while right but two months is really a lot right two months is um, beyond what normally even just the feudal service was normally owed as a private regulation uh, over time. Um, so the length of the campaign depended also on the general interest of those involved. If you fought for the king, most of the times you would be um, rewarded by staying at his side. Because if you did, first of all, you have an interest of this guy winning in some way. And so if he wins, you also kind of win something in the process, not just as a gift, but in fact, the latter does happen. You want to be noticed, you want maybe to. Uh, to marry, I don't know, the, the king's daughter. Um, so there are lots of interesting things that can uh, you can prove by being just a great commander. You can be entrusted with important um, uh, tasks and thus rewarded with important thieves. Consider that these offensive campaigns are aimed at also seizing some lands. So you can't literally be installed in somebody else's um, uh, tenures because you just won the right to rule in them 
uh, in the process. Um, other military operations were carried out in 1103. There is the capture of the dungeon of Meung sur Loire and the burning of the neighboring church. Eventually, um, the victorious defense of the castle of Montagu in the Esne. So, as we've seen here, destroyed castles, destroyed churches. This is a scorched earth strategy that at some point does pay off. Um, castles are obviously more kind of sp specialized military uh, infrastructure. Churches could be too. Many churches were fortified, but especially they were very rich, right? And they could keep supplying, say, local rulers with, with power. They were at the center of an ecclesiastical administration, so if you destroyed that, it's as if you beheaded an important amount of the local administration and political and social mechanism. It, it proved, I in many ways, also that um, God was not from the side of the church. There was something terribly wrong that had happened. Of course, these things were criticized as much as, of course, a, a Christian king would destroy a church. But um, if we had probably asked the average person in the in the army or even in the um, in the country there, well, they would have been able to explain to us very clearly and without too much uh, moralism what was the very pragmatic reason politically and strategically why that say church was destroyed right and the same goes for castles i mean castles at some point can be occupied um but others not right it depends on how much they cost um whether you can you think that area can pass suddenly again back in the hands of the enemy because castles are not really as these examples prove um uh, invulnerable uh, but also it's not that you literally control a country because you just own a castle, right? The country must be from your side. At some point, most of these castles would simply surrender, right? Uh, so because this, the 12th century begins to see a more systematic use, and especially in countries like France and England, where there is a powerful feudal state that can invest in these uh, fortifications of stone castles, as you know. Um, some of these, in fact, are pretty big for the time, as we will see uh, also with Gisors, etc., um, but the majority is actually still kind of um, pretty pretty modest and uh, it can easily be forced to, to surrender. Uh, they, stor they did storm them as well um, and in this sense always remember that the knights were the stormtroopers, right? They were the protagonists in every aspect of warfare and also the king participated to the assault so it was really a matter of promise of saying you know of, com of eternal competition within the same army proving who was the stronger etc remember that the mentality is that the king is to be the best of all so you can't be second to a vassal of yours because otherwise voices will spread rumors you will say that you're not men enough or this kind of things your political image will be destroyed so you have to show you are the best one and all the others have to follow all the others um, are ruined also in reputation if they are kind of less than your than 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 their than their leader. Uh, naturally, this is also a kind of more advanced stage of warfare compared, say, to to the comitatus and so on. And so, uh, everything is more complicated, and um, there are th there is probably a technical side of the story that is very important to uh, keep in consideration. Cavalry cost a dramatic law to require properly an entire apparatus as we've seen consider all the populations of these countries worked for providing these knights with their panoply with their training with their with their horses maintenance right the entire the, the church had to indoctrinate them to to fight uh, for a just war for god etc the entire civilizational hope revolved on the success of these men and so they had an enormous burden on themselves they had an enormous crushing responsibility uh, never believe classist uh, propaganda where people say oh these were just people exploiting others these people had the greatest burden 
of all the people who lived there, right? A peasant comparatively just, it was very tiring physically and mentally. It was also kind of oppressive in a sense to, to be in that state, but it was nothing, right? In terms of sheer amount of cost of energy spent through you mentally and physically, then, um, then a night. And, you know, I will make a video how much a night costs, but it, it's more than anything that I see in popular culture people are habituated to reason like to assess. Um, after a brief period of of truce, in 1105, Louis prepares an expedition against Montlhery. Again, close to Paris, he takes over uh, Gournay in 1107. Albeit he fails in front of Chevreuse, Montlhery, and Bretancourt. In 1108, Louis carries out a campaign in Berry to put an end to the raids of Humbert, Lord of Saint Sever, and having risen actually to the throne because he wasn't king yet but still it would be on August the 3rd of that same 1108 um, he um, obliges he forces the city of La Ferté Allée to capitulate right so um, you see here it's a relentless activity he was doing that as a prince and as a king essentially nothing changes um, the the psychological effort of this all here we're talking about several years already spent practically entirely at war here we see just one year apparently not having that but for lots of other things travels meetings councils administrative stuff so think about for example these failures that as we've seen also um, occurred um, what impact would make on a person who's constantly pressured that scale and having prepared himself or together with others uh, knights etc the the military uh, plan the, the all the logistical uh, side of the story this enormous effort they required also to convince the communities to contribute enough etc and failing and what these blows, especially repeated ones, really can affect you like. This is terrifying, right? I wonder whether the average person today would be able even, let's leave aside being intelligent enough to organize in the way they did individually, and at least with the degree of the means that they had um, at the time, uh, these kind of operations, but also to withstand the moral blows of, of failure just once right and see what happens you know, people today are stressed for for their little ones now a war takes on also a new dimension because Louis uh, adversaries are not only just the feudal lords but also the King of England Henry the first now bear in mind internationally this is an important difference yep, because yes the Duke of Normandy is the Western Frankish vassal, right? But the King of England per se is not, right? England in this regard is not considered by France like a like a thief on its own. That that was something personal that the Ducal dynasty of Normandy had conquered, uh, essentially on their own behalf for matters that were not part of like that. That was not part of the Western Frankish kingdom. It's traditionally districtually was just Britain, who had never been even part of the of the Carolingian Empire, so it was an, uh, another thing. doesn't matter how deep always the relations between northern France and, and southern England had been historically uh, since Celtic uh, times and, and throughout all the centuries. Um, it was still another reality. And consider that France has also to check all this enormous eastern frontier as well, we will see, because there is also the war against the Holy Roman Emperor, there is this deep south that is uh, also, you know, mostly out of reach uh, of the, the French king. But fighting against a foreign king, doesn't matter whether 
the, the, the English kings are French, is still something that um, moves more in terms also of, you know, military potential, because you really have a, a, a major landmass fighting against yours with evidently um, invasive purposes. It, it's for this reason that in 1109, Louis summons the royal army, the exercitus that we were talking about before, in which figured the contingents of Robert II, Count of Flanders, Thibault IV, Count of Blois, William II, Count of Nevers, Hugh II, Duke of Burgundy, and also many other uh, uh, noblemen, including archbishops and bishops. So, I already made a video about Western Frankish warfare that considers this coalitional aspect specifically. So, if you go look in the Western uh, Frankish Kingdom playlist, you will find everything. But consider this: you are essentially at war with with England, so you call for major vassals that, at this point, have remained somehow out um, of, of your struggles, or at least not so directly with their own feudal contingents literally sent in in total or at least with some degree of negotiation but for the entire force um, of Flanders, of Blois, of Nevers, of Burgundy right these are all deeply close lands to to the Ile de France politically culturally they 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 re do represent in fact the the the, ma the major establishment of the king and summoning them means, of course, to negotiate with all of them. So just think at a political, diplomatic level, at some kind of, uh, also just organizational level. Like you have to make all these troops arrive at a given place. You have to calculate how much fodder for the horses is going to be needed. Uh, how many resources are to be paid, because the local communities do not have to be squeezed more than much. So it's all very complex. The bishops n and and the archbishops do participate as well because they are vassals. They have their own retinues, just like any other. They do fight, right? It was a Carolingian tradition that the bishop had at least to accompany his own military contingents to the front, right? He, if he wanted, he could leave eventually, but as you know, many of them would wouldn't have any problem to fight and spill blood in the process. Uh, after having devastated the lands of Robert III, Count of Melun, the forces of Louis VI clash against the ones of his main foe, the King of England, at the Planche, close to Neuf uh, Saint Martin. So, what happens there is that the French and English um, Parliament and Louis even challenges Henry the first to single combat, right, to duel. Um, and the proposal is refused. And a bit like a divine revenge that they would have liked to seen like that if this was a form of cowardice. Like if you have a pro this is the idea, if you have a problem with me because say the king the, the king of France and the King of England think literally that they're their countries are their own personal private possession. This is the only mentality these people have, right? So if England goes to war with, with France or vice versa, uh, it's because you have a problem, say the, the kings have a problem with, with each other personally, right? So the idea is I am the king, so I embody my own country. I challenge you to single combat. So who wins, uh, having given our words of honor, will essentially you know, uh, obtain what was the object of contention in the war will end here because it's us, right? And the others do not have to fight. So the English king refuses, and the following day at the gates of Gisors, the Anglo Normans are defeated by the French. Um, and at the end of 1101, Louis seizes Nantes. Well, on the Atlantic, which 
uh, is um, an important uh, a, a strategic area. It's it's um, as you know not just the port, the city itself, but it's in between. It's uh, you know with the Loire, it's, it's in between Brittany, Anjou. It's an area that you need to expand and to kind of cut a bit, uh, like uh, across some territories that may easily side with with the enemy. Um, as well, so it, it's a long distance from from Paris, after all, and it um, it speaks of there the 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 defeat suffered by the Anglo Normans that year. And the following year, the momentum is exploited by Louis because Milan is seized. The war ends with the peace concluded in 1113. So this more international side of the story ceases for a while because the local robber barons uh, keep being a problem. You always have some rebel around that you need to uh, to curb, so preventing also your arms to from rusting in, in the process. So again, you're always on horseback. Right, always fighting, always pillaging, always massacring, always always setting on fire, always receiving blows, always burying your comrades. It, it's terrifying, right? But at the same time, it is functional. It's a mean to an end. You you can literally see in front of you your own power materializing and consolidating, and seeing also materially what this means in terms of income, or your control on the areas, or your you know the the, the political support you gain. The fact that the more you win, and the more people from the outside want to invest in you. That's, that's um, very uh, palpable. In 1109, there is the siege of germigny lex In 1111, there is the first siege of Puiset, the dungeon of which is, um, is uh, stormed, and the castle is set on fire. In 1112, Louis is defeated uh, near Tours, so also far away a bit from, from his basis of power, by a coalition. In fact, it has been reunited to, to, to counter this royal uh, momentum. Among the others, the forces of the Count of Blois and the ones of Raoul of Beaugency. The royal army uh, has to uh, retreat, actually to rout, and it takes refuge in Orléans, in Etampes, and in Petitvivier. Th this was important also not properly to, to burden, again, single communities with the entire brunt of, of, the, of, the, of the army. Again, the horses c consumed a, an incredible amount of, of food, and the more you concentrate forces, the higher the likelihood of some epidemic breaking out. Um, and splitting forces in a moment also where you, you can fundamentally avoid some of them being bottled up in, in a single place can be also an, uh, an important strategic safeguard. Uh, and the royal army is defeated but not destroyed definitely. And this is proven by the fact that in the same 11 and 12, um, the second siege of Puset is won by Louis. Um, there is a moment, three years, in which we don't see much uh, going on. And it's possible that, in fact, all these, uh, the, all this more than a decade actually of, of, co of prolonged warfare had exhausted the north of France, England, in any case, as we've seen, different contendants had also different problems uh, locally in turn. There were sub-vassals causing problems, there were in other international relations. Here we're skipping the entire thing, just looking at a very brief review of all the, the military operations known. Um, however, in March 1115, the military operations are resumed. March not May, yes, um, as um, this was also another common month to start early um, the operations and 
uh, normally again it uh, say in Rome uh, nor normally March was the beginning of the the war season right in, in northern France it was in May but warfare is becoming ever more um, let's say uh, professional it can be sustained uh, with more resources more energies and so also the seasonal timeline is is cracking under this right and uh, there are th there is an important effect of surprise and uh, when you mobilize can make a lot of difference strategically and it can be risky because of course in march it's still winter uh, and uh, whenever they started it during the month i don't know maybe it was already spring but still it's colder right so there is a greater effort there is a greater exhaustion it means that the earlier you begin the uh, the earlier you will finish and maybe finishing in the in the good season in a moment where maybe the enemy has mobilized later but still can continue to carry out the operations with better weather less cost etc may not necessarily be the, the thing so it's all a political game it's all about the local communities if you know that they can give you support if you have already seen what, what's going on with spies contacts and so on um, Louis does this, by the way, and he manages to seize in 1115 the castles of crecy sur serre and of nouvion la -Besse. During the assault to the Tower of Amiens in the northeast of Paris, the same Louis is wounded. Right? Um, that, that is the measure of how much they did risk uh, in person. Um, so Louis decides to retreat, also because mm, this, I don't think it was much of a psychological reason, but yes, a wounded king and commander-in-chief is not the best, but surely the, the course of operations was dictated by other factors, but the fact that the, that the king had been wounded during the assault tells you also how serious the assault was, so if, if Amiens had not fallen, it's probably because he was also well defended. So the king retreats, but still orders the blockade of the fortress, right? Because you could have essentially oppressed this place with your army, and then you had to leave. Um, and if nobody came to relieve the the uh, the, the siege, uh, the, the city from the siege, right? You could maintain a blockade. And in fact, this lasted for two years successfully. In fact, Amiens would surrender in the end. This is random, you can't afford that all the time. In that sense, it probably means that Amiens and whoever was defending it was somehow isolated politically in some way. War restarts in 1116 against Henry I of England, and in this time the King of France can count on the support of the Count of Anjou, uh, one of the most powerful princes in France. Fulk the fifth, and also the one of the Count of Flanders, Baldwin the seventh. Right, these are very powerful allies. There is a lot of uh, fighting in the Vexin, right on the Seine uh, Valley, um, close still again, extensively to Paris. Also in Picardy, in the northeast, in the in Brie, uh, and around Chartres. So different. Uh, vassals fight in different places coordinating the war between the, the kings and so on. Uh, there are many sieges, many uh, coups um, at Gasny, in Malassis, L'Aigle, Les Andelis, Dangou, Chateauneuf sur Ept. And especially there is a true and proper pitch battle that we will probably make also video on, that is the one of Bremul on August the 20th, 1119, which Louis VI suffers a severe defeat. You will see how many troops were in a major battle between England and France in the 12th century. Well, something like 400 and 500, respectively. Um, and this is interesting because it may seem a few, but mobilizing several hundreds of, of, of knights was a, a great cost. This battle is quite interesting because basically the English see the uh, the French approaching 
uh, see same strategically and so they create a sort of ambush uh, by arranging the formation essentially with just uh, 100 knights mounted and all the others in in the rear of the formation Louis gives order to attack to some of his commanders, cavalry commanders, and he m overwhelms the 100 uh, Anglo-Norman knights, except this um, cavalry line uh, uh, f basically uh, enters the, the posterior enemy lines of the dismounted knights that cut it to pieces. The second battle uh, line of the French suffers the same fate and so everything collapses eventually. Um, this is a very interesting example of how still by the, the the first half of the 12th century infantry can actually succeed against cavalry. Like from the second half of, of the 12th century especially in this properly feudalized context you don't really have infantry uh, hoping to to win uh, per se as an arm right it has always to it can resist to the enemy can inflict uh, casualties also because basically it can't run or at least it's it's likely going to be cut um, down more likely during the route than uh, during combat so the um, the, the point being that that the, the, the broader feudal tactics again a full shock charge etc were there were very advanced especially in these areas but still a sturdy motivated infantry especially if placed on a good terrain etc could m make um, miracles right maybe not so miracles because at the end of the day we're still talking about times when um, the, uh, the the infantry that we see here is not even it, it's made up mostly by n dismounted knights, right? This this is kind of normal. You see also in the Bayet tapestry at least that the the outrage depicted characters are somehow equipped in the same way, both in the Anglo-Saxon uh, feared and in the Norman cavalry, right? So there are of course th those are the just the elite. They make up the first ranks. M most of the cases, the rest of the infantry or the lighter elements in general, also mounted, are auxiliary. But still, those dismounted knights can't really uh, resist a cavalry charge, and so successful. So this is an interesting account of that. That the uh, I made a video about English and uh, English warfare during roughly this time, a bit more. Uh, stretched as a timeline but addressing this problem is to say how much of the Anglo-Saxon infantry capability had been absorbed by the Normans in England well there is a wild debate about this because it's not so easy to understand that like Anglo-Norman England was now a fully Western Frankish thing as we were saying before uh, but it's possible that uh, infantry forces were more significantly developed uh, or at least qualitative than than the, the French ones, right? That the communal forces of France m must not be underestimated. There were lots of them. Um, our perception is a bit blurred by historiography because, of course, nobody really cared more than much about the infantry. Um, that, in any case, was dominated, as the example of Bermuda, also f from the uh, Anglo-Norman side, by by knights. Right, so these were essentially the descendants of the same invaders of those who just were actually they felt themselves more French and spent more time in front th 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 than in England because they simply it was their home and just they, they liked it also better in general as a place to live than England but at the same time um, you still can see probably something in the English forces that that was a bit more reminiscent of that kind of Anglo-Danish background where still the infantry, the average freemen participated more. Uh, it's, it's really imperceptible, of course, also Anglo-Danish England before the, the Norman conquest was heavily privatized, um, you know, the, the feared was not so 
uh, effective as it used to be. Uh, the average Freeman had impoverished and weakened, and you know, there were semi-professional forces essentially controlling the Huskars, the, the you know, the being the decisive element of the army. But everything was also a matter of how many elements you could put together, and we see in arms and armor in Britain still an import that the northern you go, of course. But in this sense, in also in the least relevant places you go, uh, compared to the to what the Normans had bre- brought with their Western Frankish military culture, an important still kind of again foot uh, fighting style uh, of s- of some degree. Again, it's imperceptible. Cavalry was everywhere. It's just the degrees that we we can see from some hints being slightly, slight, slightly different slightly don't think that again the anglo danish uh, the anglo normans were you know uh, now uh, they had more infantry like that's why the, in the hundred years of war the england fought this man no it has literally nothing to do with that but you can't be sure about it um uh so mm, as it happens, like the defeat, the French defeat at Bremul is quite heavy, but it also triggers a very strong reaction, showing, of course, the resources of the Capetians. The next objective of Louis is the capture of Breteuil, and in order to uh, succeed, the king orders his bishops to reach him with their diocesan militias. Um, As we've said, also the bishops were somehow militarized, they had retinues, etc., but they were functionally becoming ever less so, in a way. Um, At least there was, in in a country like France, ever the the ever greater separation between the two functions and roles. In, again, more politically fragmented and thus unstable areas like Germany or Italy, you can find bishops that being very warlike and habitually probably being men of war. Also for the the, the processes through which they, they became they, they they weren't politically involved. In France it's it it is important too, but it's slightly different. Also the English do not have the same thing. In fact they were b- very surprised when they saw how the Germans, for example, were habituated in that regard. Um so uh, Ordericus Vitalis in his chronicle speaks on, on this occasion of mass levies mobilized from the following regions Burgundy, De Berry, Auvergne, Senonais, Parisi, Orléanaise, Vermandois, Beauvaisy, Lenois, Perron, Nel, Noyon, Lille, Tournai, Arras, Gournay, Clermont, etc. Um, but uh, all this effort is wasted at the end of the day, or at least you know, it, it doesn't succeed in capturing Bretuvia. In December 1120, uh, the King of France and one of England s- uh, sign a peace that, among other things, contemplates the restitutions of the castles and the liberation of the prisoners. Um, so, as you understand, it's ju- this was just a last effort by Louis to, 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 to try to to invest the last resources before the system, the momentum ceased, because this is yet another aspect. Like when you have still an army standing there, you you want uh, you want to try everything, right? So you, uh, if you have some reserves, you have the possibility, of course, of winning or something. You will try this last push, which is uh, what uh, will shorten the times fundamentally rather than lengthening them, that in war is deleterious, meaning that, you know, if you really spe- if you have an initiative and you lengthen it, you're an idiot, right? I- if you want to conquer anywhere, you just use the, the greatest power immediately, and if you can't, it's just because you're not strong enough. Um, so, uh, of course, the campaign up to Bukatoya had probably been normal, uh, you know, in case of defeat, you, you, are, you go under, and so... This was like a desperate push, and it fails. Um, so this game, as you understand, is continuously about, I move here, you move there. Uh, all medieval warfare here is 
uh, about essentially relieving a city that is under siege by someone else um, and um, the um, the, a the enemy of course will prevent it so a battle pitch battle will, will follow we talk about pitch battles like saying ah, Pokemon was the only one but there is no real difference uh, in the ways battles were fought compared to what we don't consider them as pitch ones or something like that even tournaments were some kind of they, they were the same as battles especially in this period uh, we've seen that the same Bramul uh, just 400 versus 500 knights uh, pretty modest uh, for not for the times but you know overall so other clashes were smaller but they were fought still proportionally in the same ways you would fall f fight another larger engagements I I'm perhaps one of the few people today that studies also the smaller engagements on a regular basis uh, and not just for the sake of anecdote and systemically speaking you can't really say well you know since this was like a a lesser documented battle or very often you also have battles of some importance numerically that somehow are less detailed historically than than others and so they people forget about them but there were so many of these that you can't say well this is not um, you know we can't just pinpoint I don't know Bramul and can't think that there was another one maybe that was also important somewhere else still we don't have the clear picture of the wall it's just from the 13th century that we begin to um, especially also these areas don't think that are so overwhelmingly documented right at least the it's the elite that writes so there is not much of a historiographical competition to sharpen the details etc it's uh, it's just like a, a big mediated tale right and the, the the reality of warfare we can reconstruct to other things it's it's made by not just of course other operations than pitch battles but by many more clashes than we think I mean if 100 versus 100 knights met uh, one of these engagements well isn't that also kind of a pitch battle in, in itself where do you draw the line of course sieges raids skirmishes were the the habitual praxis but it was not like a a different this is what I often also pointed out that we try people who don't study warfare go study the administrative stuff and say yeah oh, let's try to understand what kind of campaign this was by just how it was called in a chronicle and as if you know the term that a chronicle uses is or even if it were just an administrative document were were able to reconstruct the the, the type of operation militarily speaking just because it was caused called like that rather than another maybe just it's a local way the the author called that expedition as opposed to another um, and when you actually study the, the military practice you realize that of course there is no difference these were basically the same type of operations that were repeated against it was again either against castles or armies or, or raids but yes conceptually but in practice they were the same thing I mean they did this at the same time in every moment because you can't raid a place or besiege a castle thinking that you will not engage an enemy uh, or or that this will not happen anyway right so in, in open field right so it, it's it's a um, modernistic secularistic mis mis misunderstanding properly of the of even what war is in practice um, and yet there is this m method right given that they fought all the time they were very skillful in say planning the operations mobilizing the troops choosing the targets and so on so it's almost like a chess game and in fact the fashion of this game begins to spread in the west um, importantly this time or at least to concretize more for us to be documented because there's th there always were similar games uh, in um, in uh, uh, since ever let's say and just of course they have a very few to do with strategy th but it was a, a way just to train your mind to to accept defeat or victory or these kind of things rather than 
you know, teaching you how to fight because chess, frankly, has nothing to do with war. Um, maybe just the allegory of it was, was likable as a context, but it's not more, um, you know, it's not really definitely teaching you how to lead an army to fight. Um, but this is not the end, because in the meanwhile, the military campaigns increase, right, uh, in size. It's again a moment in Europe in which warfare was expanding brutally, like even economically speaking, the 12th century is a moment of great growth, also great unbalancements, and so greater conflict in, in the process. But armies are increasing in size as well. In 1122, Louis summons in Bourges a great army with the participation of the Counts of Anjou, of Brittany, and of Nevers, these also very important vassals. In 1124 there is the great uh, Germanic invasion for which uh, the, the war takes on an even more ideological meaning. The, the Western Frankish royal banner is raised in Saint-Denis that, as you know, is a lord of the King of France because the Traditionally, the, the the French kings were, as you know, vassals of the Abbey of Saint Denis. And remember this: that France, as a concept, as a country, as a people, as a culture, is exclusively Saint Denis. Right? There is out of Saint Denis, there is n nothing f French uh, wise. Right? S France is exclusively the Abbey of Saint Denis in all its meaning, in all its blood, in all its imperial power, in all its um, cultural supremacy, the Flamme, the monarchy, the idea that the king never really dies, right? This is the metaphysical, um, traditional, universal realization of the empire, right? I made a, a video on the the imperial essence of the French uh, monarchy, right, uh, recently, and explaining how this would evolve further, right, and this cult is in fact being cultivated further, the more also warfare uh, develops. In 1126 there is a second expedition in Auvergne, in 1127-28 two expeditions in Flanders, so you see here there is a an important also extension of the um, of the range of um, military operations territorially. In 1137 there is a campaign in Aquitaine directed by the future King Louis VII. Uh, in parallel um, there are ever less small operations. This is interesting because it shows that evidently those prolonged um, wars in the previous decades had conferred to the Western Frankish kings a greater power, greater deterrence that is showed by in fact the military potential displayed later. So it was, uh, it had been shown in a politically and military successful way that if you wanted to rebel the king would blast you right so um, th there was no point properly of opposing oneself to it consider that some names that we have seen here and there Momog and C etc um, uh, were to become actually one of the greatest centers of French royal power right because eventually the Capetians settle their family members and other branches, etc., all around, so that they can strengthen their core of power locally, politically. Um, there are still minor operations of that kind, however. In 1128, there is the capture and destruction of the castle of Ivry. In 1130, there is the attempt to seize um, the Cosne area. In 1132, there is a royal defeat in front of La Fere. In 1133 there is the fire of Bonneval. In 1135 there is the capture and the destruction of the castle of Saint-Brisson-sur-Loire. 
that was the last victorious campaign of Louis the Sixth. So you understand a life spent fighting, right? Um, so overall, uh, what can we say? We have described essentially the major dynamics. Uh, we see that the majority of the clashes were uh, distributed within um, geographically limited space around 40,000 square kilometers so something mostly within the range of you know a couple of hundred kilometers um, even though the field battles they say the pitch battles were more rare as always of, of the sieges uh, but I wouldn't count too much on this on stressing you know how m much less they were because again um, we have to also analyze in fact how big these armies really were what they were doing what kind of sieges were etc so the um, in fact the, the the amount of troops were often modest very modest also the same campaign was short in duration the the risks and the losses well those were not limited doesn't mean that you said I don't know 40 nights at this time going somewhere you know besieging uh, a mountain bailey castle and they're ambushed and massacred but this is not a heavy loss 40 nights cost an enormous much so the idea that these guys were oh, it's just feudal warfare they're not really killing anyone or whatever it's uh, in my opinion is one of the single uh, as a military historian uh, specialized in, in fact medieval warfare um, it's one of the single greatest misunderstandings of uh, medieval warfare in fact um, it, the, there is a, an obvious proportionality to the means available right these were even large powers yes as we've seen the Ile de France is modest the French kings do not have this huge territorial control, but they're still basically the, the most powerful guys around, at least in France. They um, uh, they control an important amount of people, of land anyway, and if you start making some approximate math of how much, again, a knight could cost etc you realize that the the surplus available for the time was almost entirely spent um, in uh, you know uh, over the survival rate for war and that this war actually was a hugely profitable investment you see that it, it's after decades of war that these kings managed to increase their own power remarkably and the, the same agent for change also abroad because every power kind of toughens up in order to cope with the ever more powerful enemies in the process and that's also how you spread that kind of culture indirectly French uh, French uh, culture arrives everywhere not just because the French conquer much else outside of, of France ever uh, aside from during the Crusades uh, they don't set foot elsewhere but it's the model that they use that obliges the others to competitively adapt and that was a successful model as I understand um, devastations too right devastations may seem reduced but the question is also what what do you devastate for it's not just economy it's you know it's essentially a sort of terroristic policy it has to do with you know pressuring someone and it costs right I if if the devastation appears to be limited it's also because probably the the capacity of destroying was was you know uh, was limited by resources themselves uh, these were also places that the same French king wanted to conquer afterwards so everything depended on politics and on society why do you attack a, a, a vassal right would it be better if this didn't happen of course if the vassal rebels you also must have a reason of some sort and this reason must be addressed but it's not that you are just systematically destroying people for no reason this is yet the other thing that people hardly get right you, you want to obtain a result you may have a completely 
wrong idea of how it works, but surely a 12th century king knew much better, right, than than us how things worked at the time. Um, and so it doesn't seem to me like a modest effort or a modest loss or a modest consumption. As a matter of fact, it seems to me that these costs are enormous, just as the devastations, as, as the losses. Um, and in fact, this is well exemplified by the constant uh, presence of war, just even as a warring as a as an eventuality it's something literally looming over you all the time and that everybody was quite concerned with by the way right so these were not the only wars being fought in france by the way uh, by the french uh, many were uh, going to the crusades others were being employed somewhere else in europe so th this was just um, uh, as mercenaries and you know settlers sometimes even not to come back to france um, so what we're looking at here is of course um the policy of essentially the uh, principalities competing with each other on a provincial scale that aims to become regional and i think considering the uh, the politics and the society of the time that not only they were very good at what they did but they also employed an enormous amount of forces Accord, right, and they were dramatically pressured by the events, and always risking to be overthrown, always risking crises, always having to cope with um, enormous issues from uh, f just for the same feudal dynastic reasons, right? You know, you, you never knew, you couldn't really predict this system. How do you know who of the children of that guy would survive to inherit? And what maybe you could make your daughter married to him, and then on you have to think in perspective was first in line, second in line, what kind of politics they had. It, it, it's a mess, and you can't control it. Just think about the, the, sh the, the wreck of the white ship in the same time in England. That you know, how can you that, that changed basically the entire English history? Random. Right, and everything is random as it can be. So of course there is an enormous effort to make things go the way you want. And at the end of the day it does succeed. Because you have a power there that you're enacting uh, and that changes the world. And it changes it for something that we still remember for obvious reasons today. And so this is it. We'll talk a lot about Western Frankish warfare, we'll talk about Eastern Frankish warfare, Italic warfare and so on uh, in the same ways because they really matter uh, and any other countries for that matter will have the time and opportunity of making this kind of videos. Um, for today, however, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.